Welcome to this episode of the Zoology Podcast for June. Now on this episode I'm going to be talking about the amazing gene editing phenomenon that is CRISPR. That's C-R-I-S-P-R, pronounced CRISPR. And it stands for Clusters of Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. CRISPR is a family of DNA sequences which are found in the genomes of the mostly single-celled prokaryote organisms, archaea and bacteria. These archaea and bacteria use CRISPR to detect and destroy DNA from viruses known as bacteriophages. CRISPR manages to do this through the interaction of nucleotide repeats, spacers, and Cas9. Nucleotide repeats are sequences of DNA which are present throughout the CRISPR region, while spacers are bits of DNA that are interspersed among the CRISPR nucleotide repeats. So that's say you've got a repeat, then a spacer, a repeat, then a spacer. However, spacers are special because they are actually obtained from the virus itself. When a bacteria is first invaded by a bacteriophage, the bacteria's immune response reacts by capturing phage DNA, and it then inserts it into a CRISPR locus in the form of a spacer. These spacers are then transcribed into the single standard sequence of CRISPR RNA, using CRISPR's nucleotide repeats as a template. These RNA sequences are able to detect any matching sequence of DNA, and once a target section of DNA has been detected, the CRISPR system produces an enzyme called Cas9. Cas9 binds to two types of CRISPR RNA, and it's this RNA which guides Cas9 along the strands of foreign DNA until it finds and binds to a stretch of target DNA which matches the CRISPR RNA sequence. Once attached, Cas9 acts like a pair of molecular scissors. In other words, it cuts apart the strands of DNA at two specific sites, resulting in the DNA no longer functioning. This is known as a double-stranded break. Now that's an amazing way to defeat a viral infection. But what's equally impressive is that DNA from these encounters remains stored in the CRISPR spaces, so that in an event of a future infection by the same or similar phage, then the CRISPR system can be used again and again to effectively destroy viral DNA, and thus the infection. In short, these CRISPR spaces act in the form of a viral DNA memory bank, which results in long-term acquired immunity. Now some of you may be asking the same question I was when I was doing my research for this podcast. And that is, if CRISPR RNA targets and finds specific viral DNA sequences, what stops it finding, targeting, and cutting those DNA sequences used by other CRISPR systems? Because obviously these systems will also have the viral DNA within them. Well, the CRISPR system has an ingenious built-in safety feature, which stops Cas9 from just cutting wherever the target DNA is found. CRISPR uses short DNA sequences known as photospacer adjacent motifs. That's PAMs for short to serve as tags of where to cut. In other words, Cas9 will not cut a section of target DNA if a PAM isn't present on either end of the DNA sequence. But when a PAM is present, then Cas9 is going to take that DNA to the chopping block. Overall, CRISPR sounds complicated, but putting it simply, it's just a system that steals foreign DNA to create RNA, then uses the RNA to find identical foreign DNA and attach an enzyme to cut the found DNA apart, thus rendering the intruder inoperable. Okay, so that's easy to understand, but perhaps the most game-changing aspect of CRISPR is how it can be manipulated for use as a genome editing tool. Scientists have figured out that by changing the nucleotide sequences used by CRISPR RNA, Cas9 can be used to cut any section of DNA. Perhaps equally as exciting is that the two pieces of CRISPR RNA needed to guide Cas9 have now been modified into a single guiding piece of RNA, which means that scientists simply need guide RNA and Cas9 to begin genome editing which is just amazing. But what is genome editing? Well, genome editing involves changing DNA sequences, thereby changing the instructions which they encode. This can be done by inserting a cut or break in the DNA and then using one of two methods. The first method is called non-homologous end joining. And this comes from when a DNA's natural repair mechanisms cause a mutation through accidentally inserting or deleting nucleotides. For example, using this method, a section of DNA which reads CAGT may experience a break on the A and G, and the DNA repair mechanism may accidentally repair this break, resulting in the DNA now reading CCTT, or even CAAGT. Obviously, this method can result in unwanted mutations and even the loss of the DNA's function altogether. The second method involves filling in the DNA's break with a sequence of nucleotides. Scientists can select a short strand of DNA and insert it as a template. This will then fill in the gap of the broken DNA strand. 
The benefit of using this method is that scientists can choose any sequence of DNA they want. This means by using CRISPR gene editing technology, we essentially give ourselves the potential to radically control the building blocks of life. So, that begs the question, what can humankind do with such a power? And should we even be messing around with the building blocks of life that are so needed for evolution to take place in the first place? Well, I'm not a philosopher, so I can't tell you if we should or should not be messing around with this technology on a moral level, but I can tell you about what scientists have already done and then you can think about if it's a moral use of this technology or not. Okay, let's begin with something near and dear to all our hearts, and that would be our stomachs, or more accurately, the food we put into them. So traditionally, to alter a plant, we have had to place it through selective breeding to enhance the traits we want and reduce the traits we don't. However, now that we can use CRISPR to edit a plant's genome, we can select the traits we want or delete traits we don't, thereby reducing the time it takes to get the desired product, from many generations to only a couple of years. So what are scientists currently trying to produce? Well, many things actually. For all you coffee heads out there, CRISPR is currently being used to tweak the caffeine levels in coffee beans to produce a decaffeinated variety of coffee which still retains all its flavour. Okay, so that's pretty cool. But what goes well with a nice coffee? How about a sweet banana or some chocolate? Well, CRISPR is currently being used to increase banana and cocoa trees' resistance to viral and fungal diseases, which if successful means less bananas and cocoa beans will be lost to disease, thereby increasing the amount of them on the open market, and thus hopefully resulting in a lower price for you and me at the grocery store. So that's all very exciting. But now, as much as I would want to live on a chocolate diet, it's just not an option, and most of the world don't eat it as a staple anyways. However, rice is a staple for much of the world, and this makes it an ideal produce for genetic manipulation. Well, that's maybe a bit of an understatement, because scientists have jumped with both feet first into using CRISPR to improve rice in a variety of ways. In their 2020 paper, Kashaf Zafar and colleagues explained that CRISPR is being used to modify rice in the following ways. Multiple scientists have created rice strains which produce more grain per plant, with some plants producing up to 68% more in their yield. Now that's a massive increase in the amount of rice we could get onto the market and therefore the amount of mouths we could potentially feed, perhaps saving many, many lives. Okay, but maybe we don't actually need to produce more rice because we already produce enough food to feed the world anyway. Maybe we just need to improve the quality of rice we do produce. Well, scientists are currently producing rice which produces more healthy oils, have increased amounts of B-carotene, that's the precursor to vitamin A, and actually makes the rice appear gold in colour. Or perhaps you'd like red rice. Well, scientists are producing that too. Okay, so rice has been made to be healthier, but scientists have also produced rice which is lower in heavy metal content, thereby making consumption of large quantities of rice less dangerous. Now, healthier, more nutritious rice is all well and good. But what's the point if your rice plants can't survive in an ever-changing environment? Well, scientists have made rice strains which are better at surviving in the cold, during a drought, and even rice which is more tolerant to salt and herbicides. Hell, rice strains which are resistant to various fungal diseases have also been developed. So this is all really quite an exciting field of CRISPR research, which has the potential to revolutionise the amount and quality of food that we all have access to. So we can rid food of deleterious traits, but what is good food if the people consuming it are themselves unhealthy? Well, CRISPR doesn't just restrict the food we consume, it can also be used on ourselves. Perhaps one of the most exciting and morally justifiable applications of using CRISPR to edit a human genome is its potential to treat genetic disorders caused by single gene mutations, such as cystic fibrosis or Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. In fact, Gerald Schwank and colleagues have already used CRISPR on adult intestinal stem cells to correct the most common mutations which cause cystic fibrosis. And with their correction, they found that the function of the transmembrane conductor receptor, which causes cystic fibrosis, was actually restored. Now isn't that just amazing? Imagine if we could offer people the chance to not suffer from genetic diseases which are now completely correctable. Well, speaking as a person who has a friend who struggles with the knowledge that they might have Huntington's disease, I truly think that using CRISPR in this way could be a blessing if done safely and for the right reasons. However, it could also be a curse if used dangerously. Luckily though, the scientific community agrees that using it to genetically modify living humans is a no-go zone until we have discussed deeply the moral framework surrounding human genetic manipulation 
and have a tool which is extremely safe and accurate. Well, that was until 2018, when a Chinese scientist, now please forgive my pronunciation, I'm British and we're terrible with foreign names, but here goes my best shot. He, Jiangku. Well, he stepped over the ethical line and actually used CRISPR to edit embryos produced by in vitro fertilization of HIV negative women with the sperm provided by HIV positive men. Now, he Jenku and his colleagues used CRISPR to produce a mutation in the CCR5 gene by making the CCR5 protein non-functional in an attempt to confer genetic resistance to HIV. The result of this genetic manipulation was the birth of two reportedly healthy twin baby girls called Lulu and Nana, both of which carried a copy of the normal CCR5 gene and an edited CCR5 gene with the desired mutation. Also, in 2019, it came to light that a second woman had carried another genetically modified baby to term. Obviously, the scientific community found out about the modifications of these twins, and well, to say it was controversial might be putting it lightly. He Jenku was criticised extremely by leaders in the field of genetic engineering and bioethics, but also by the university for which he worked, who said he conducted the research in secret, and by the Chinese Academy of Medical Science, who stated that his work broke Chinese law. However, some evidence has come to light that the Chinese government may have actually provided funds towards Mr. Jenku's CRISPR experiment. And to that, all I can say is, tut tut tut. The Chinese authorities do seem to have an effective way to get their money back. Because on the 30th of December in 2019, He Jenku was found guilty of forging documents and unethical conduct landing him with a three-year prison sentence and a three million yuan fine. That's about 430,000 US dollars or 308,000 pounds sterling. His two colleagues also got prison sentences of 18 months and two years and a fine of 1 million yuan and 500,000 yuan. Both for forging ethical review documents and for misleading doctors into implanting genetically modified embryos. Okay, so that's all pretty bad. But it gets even spicier. In February 2019, it was reported that Lulu and Nana may have been unintentionally, or perhaps intentionally, had their brain structures modified, since the CCR5 gene has been linked to improved memory function in mice and better recovery from strokes in humans. Now, here's the funny bit. He Junku stated during the second international summit on human genome editing that he was against using the genome editing for enhancement. <laughs> But, but come on, man. Like, he's trying to enhance these girls to be resistant to HIV, but he's against genetic enhancement. You know what? Boy, he must think, you know, he's the smartest man in the planet to pour a quick one like that over the world's eyes. <laughs> Just, jeez. <laughs> it's hardly believable. What's even better is that he also acknowledged that he was aware that the CCR5 gene is linked to enhanced memory function. So he's fully aware of what he's doing. But no, he wouldn't modify these girls to genetically enhance them despite doing exactly that. And no, he definitely wouldn't do it in relation to memory enhancement despite knowing the CCR5 gene is linked to enhanced memory. God, if you believe that, then I have a genetically modified winged horse to sell you. Honestly, what I think is going to be interesting is how these girls are treated in the future. Will they be able to leave China, seeing as they are technically genetically modified organisms? And what about breeding? They've been modified at the germline, which means any eggs they produce may also carry their modified genes. So in this case, they are actually a gateway for introducing genetically modified genes into the wider human gene pool. So that begs the question, should Lulu and Nana be allowed to procreate? I mean, if any government has the power to stop people procreating, it's the Chinese government. So yes, that's all interesting, but problems for the future, I think. But for now, I just hope that these little girls grow up to be healthy and get to live as normal lives as possible. Though, this whole editing of the human genome does bring up questions for what will happen in the future. Will designer babies eventually happen? That is the ability for parents to choose what genetic traits their children will receive? Perhaps you're from a family of short-sighted people, or you've been cursed with baldness. Genetic modification makes it possible that your children could have perfect 2020 vision or a luscious head of hair for their entire life. Or perhaps things eventually end in a more German direction 
and countries start producing Ubermensch. The scary thing about that is that, say if a country with a dubious moral standard secretly funds CRISPR research into creating humans with enhanced memory, or improved cognitive or physical capabilities, well, then the downstream reward that that country may gain from all other areas of life will be immense and could potentially alter the course of world affairs as we know it. Now this means that if other countries do not break their moral code and start creating their own Captain Americas, they will quickly be left in the dirt. And perhaps in an even more dystopian view, the world could end up with one higher caste of modified Ubermensch, all from one country, and a lower class of everyone else just trying to scrape by. God, what an awful thought. On a just as mixed note, CRISPR has also been suggested for use to modify mosquito genes so that they are unable to transmit malaria. This would be achieved through an action called a gene drive. The way that a gene drive works is by using CRISPR and some RNA to alter, insert or silence a specific gene into a chromosome and then cut the same section out of the partner chromosome. The animal's genetic repair system will then try to repair the break in the partner chromosome using the new modified genes as the transcript, resulting in both chromosomes having a copy of the desired genes. This means that 100% of the animal's offspring will have the modified genes this will allow the genes to spread rapidly throughout a population. This rapid spread is why it's known as a gene drive. Now this sounds good, a chance to finally wipe out a parasite which has caused so many millions of human deaths. However, personally, I would advise caution, because once you start messing about with this kind of genetic relationship, you will create the evolutionary environment needed to not only produce animals which have a resistance to gene drives, especially if the gene drive causes an early death in the animal, but you will also create an evolutionary environment for malaria to become more invasive and perhaps even more fatal to human health. Unfortunately for us, mapping evolutionary effects can be really difficult, so only time will tell what could potentially happen. Okay, but let's leave the podcast on a little wondrous note. CRISPR has been suggested to have the capabilities to bring extinct animals back into existence, as long as we have the genetic material. So yeah, we could bring back something like the woolly mammoth. However, some of you may already be seeing a flaw in the system. CRISPR modifies the genes in an already living organism, but we don't have any living woolly mammoths. So how can we bring one back? Well, honestly, we strictly can't, but we also can. So CRISPR will allow us to insert the genetic material of the woolly mammoths, which we currently have preserved, into an elephant's sperm or eggs thereby creating a hybrid fetus of the two. This hybrid could potentially look and have the traits of a woolly mammoth, and if a big enough population could be achieved, then we could couple this with a technique known as backbreeding over a long enough time period to eventually have a population that exists mostly of woolly mammoth genes, and thereby have actual woolly mammoths roaming the earth once again. However, from all this rambling, you can probably tell that despite CRISPR being used to insert DNA, stop genes from functioning, or turn genes on or off, it's still actually limited in its genetic engineering capabilities. And even with it being the safest form of gene modification we currently have, it still isn't 100% safe or predictable, and perhaps this is currently for the best. Because until we humans have the right moral framework in place, and are prepared to deal with the environmental, evolutionary and societal fallout that being able to play genetic gods grants us, we will not be worthy of shouldering such a burden.